Okay. Okay. Welcome to our Fish Frenzy event. Um, I am Christine Forrest. I'm co-chair of the Royal River Alliance. And uh, we are a membership organization and we're dedicated to restoring the health of the Royal River and opening up fish passage. And so tonight's event is very ti timely, I think. Um, and I wanna thank Steve Hines who has been working diligently to, uh, yes, to do this uh, fishing map guide of the Royal River. And um, Steve is a, a member of the Alliance and also a Sebago TU member as well. So thank you, Steve. And also Steve will be presenting at the end and uh, starting our presentation will be Landis Hudson, who is executive director of Maine Rivers. So welcome Landis. Oh, and also uh, we're gonna have Q&A tonight. So um, if you have any questions you wanna ask, type them into the chat room, please. And I think Steve's gonna read your questions. Okay, so uh, can folks see the uh, alewife trail map on your screens? Yep. Great. Well, May is always an exciting time in Maine if you are interested in native migratory fish, which aren't we all? Um, so a couple of years ago, I was giving a talk actually at a school in Gardner and um, Somebody came up to me afterward and said, how come there's no map so we can find out where to see alewives in the spring? And um, that individual ended up helping me create this map. And basically um, it's a way to celebrate one of the natural wonders of springtime, one of the epic and amazing uh, natural phenomenon that, that we can see in the world. So this is the time when alewives and um, other migratory fish make their way from the ocean up into lakes and streams to reproduce. So they are one of um, 11 diadromous species, meaning that they need to live in freshwater and salt water. And um, that's what they um, must do in order to complete their life cycle. So this is, uh, a map which focuses on uh, alewives, which are also known as river herring. And they were once phenomenally prolific throughout Maine's rivers and streams, coming up um, into our waterways at this time of year, kind of between Mother's Day and Father's Day, um, such that people said that the rivers were so filled with fish that they could be um, seen as, as running silver. It's still uh, possible to see large numbers of fish. However, due to the large numbers of dams in our rivers, we don't have nearly as many fish as we should, but a lot of uh, wonderful organizations have been involved in trying to restore and bring back the numbers of uh, these fish. So um, diadromous species include uh, alewives, blueback herring, Atlantic salmon, American eel, uh, American shad, sea lamprey. They're all really fascinating creatures. And when you learn about them, you too may be uh, taken away and fascinated by um, their life and their life history. So this map is available on the Maine Rivers website, which is mainerivers.org. You can print it out, have a look, and it basically will give you some ideas about places to go. We included a bit of information um, about um, uh, harvesting. I have to let you know that we um, didn't do a lot of work to update it this year because of COVID. So everything is a little bit um, cross your fingers and, and uh, hope that things are as they, um, they uh, should be. I will let you know that um, I was in touch with the um, fish warden for Benton. So uh, one of the more amazing stories probably in my opinion, actually the most amazing story about fisheries restoration is in the Kennebec, where the Edwards Dam removal and then the Fort Halifax Dam removal, um, uh, which occurred uh, about um, 21 years ago for the Edwards Dam. There are now um, millions and millions of alewives that are able to make their way into the Kennebec and Sebastocook systems. And in fact, at Benton Falls, 
today, 1.3 million fish were able to make their way in a lift over that dam. And um, uh, 15 years ago, that number was virtually none. Um, also today, nearly 80,000 alewives made their way into Saint, the St. Croix River, and it wasn't that long ago, 1992, that number was about 800. So our rivers have suffered tremendously from large numbers of dams, and um, I'm happy to say that there are a um, lot of efforts going on in the state to try and bring back numbers of fish. Um, we do know that um, Damariscotta Mills has um, alewives running currently. Um, so that's a good place to go see them. Um, the Mousam River running through Kennebunk, uh, fish can be seen there. It's not ultimately a super happy story because those fish are blocked by a dam which is just about under Route 1, but stay tuned. And if you're interested in fish passage, you can be involved in efforts to try and improve that situation. So um, feel free to, um, I guess, ask me any questions later. And if you decide to go out and look for alewives, um, by yourself or with a friend or somebody from your family. Look around for birds like eagle and osprey. Those are often indicators that fish are moving through the system and can be found because they like to munch on them. You may want to bring some polarized sunglasses. Those can um, help you see in the water. If you're really ambitious, maybe a GoPro camera to look under the water. It's it's really fun and, and you know, the winter was uh, long and dark for many creatures and having these fish come back is um, really short of a, 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 a miracle, both in terms of um, their journey, but also for the creatures that uh, traditionally like to eat them, including, you know, eagles, osprey, bear, foxes, many, many other creatures. So I think that's about all I am going to say, unless anybody wants to uh, yeah, ask. Uh, Carl, Carl's got a question, uh, Landis. Are alewives currently uh, running uh, up into Highland Lake in Westbrook, uh, Wyndham uh, at three, Route 302? Um, they will be. I haven't heard that they are today. And so the, the, the challenge in our modern lives is that we expect to know where everything is all the time. And yet alewives tend to um, follow um, their own sense of when it's time to move. So what we hear is that they, you know, one river may be, um, Having, having their fish back and it may be a day or two or a week before others do. So um, Highland Lake will have fish back. I haven't heard that they do um, currently. So stay tuned. So I guess just to clarify then, what are the three nearest places on the alewife map that we know there are alewives currently running? Uh, Damaris got a mills, um, the Mousam River, uh, and they are running throughout the Kennebec system. So we saw um, large numbers in Cobbacy Stream. It's a little bit of a, a chore to get down to the stream there, but there is a beautiful um, path along um, Harrison Avenue in Gardner, but prepare for poison ivy. Um, and um, to, often you can see fish um, that are being um, essentially trucked further up into the Androscoggin and you can see them at the um, um, Brunswick Mill. However, I believe with COVID, a lot of um, things have closed. So keep that in the back of your mind for next year. It's really fun to see them. Definitely not natural. It's a big glass wall. <laughs> and you can see them moving up a, a fishway and being um, transported further into the watershed. So for Royal, Royal River interests, we know that alewives were present in this system um, in certainly in the 80s and then a long, long time ago. Alewives do rely, what they're really looking for when they make their way up from the ocean is lake or pond habitat. So the Royal River watershed, does, watershed doesn't have large amounts of lakes or ponds and they didn't um, make their way into um, Sabbath Day Lake. However, we do know from documents in the 1820s um, that uh, alewives, shad, and salmon um, were, were present in um, this river system. Any other questions? Not so much? 
Oh, okay, I, that's, I, that's I, all the questions I see. So uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Landis. Oh, was Christine going to ask one? Yeah, yeah, just um, one question. What do you think, um, when do you think or will the alewives return to the Royal River? Well, um, that's up to, I mean, a, a lot of the, um, these things don't generally happen on their own. It takes a lot of effort and it takes volunteers and the fish cannot move their way past impassable dams. So um, when, um, for instance, we were talking about the um, China Lake project um, that Matt and I have been working on. In that particular case, the Department of Marine Resources put adult fish directly into the lake and they were able to migrate out. And then the, the, um, those fish and their offspring would, would come back. And that is something that has been done in the Royal River watershed in the past. So with some energy and with planning and with work um, to connect with the Department of Marine Resources, that could be possible. It would have to be part of a, a whole um, plan, but um, it certainly could be done. Great, but, thank you. Um, at this point, it's really a matter of, of you know, coming up with an overall plan. Yes. Thank you. Sure. So, um, Landis, can you unshare your screen? Oops. There we go. Yeah, and just just uh, Janet uh, Hansen just uh, noted in the chat box that they visited the Nequasset uh, fish ladder on uh, Saturday. That's in Woolwich, and right. there are a lot of uh, whale wives running there. So that's that's not a far drive either. If somebody wants to go really see a whole mess of fish. Nequasset would probably be great. Check the tides, because I imagine the fish come in on a high tide and you tend to see more of them. Yep, yep. Yep, Landis. Um, and that's one place where you can go stand right over the fish ladder and you know practically touch the fish as they're going up to get into the lake. It's pretty, uh, pretty, pretty close quarters. <laughs> yeah, great. OK, thank you, Landis. Sure. Um, and now we're going to hear from um, Nick Kalis, who is a state fisheries biologist and who has been nice enough to join us tonight. And uh, I, the one thing I will say, if you haven't got your main fishing license yet, you will not be able to see his screen, unfortunately. It'll, it'll be blacked out. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Sorry, just had to say that. But welcome, welcome, Nick. Thanks, and I, I do appreciate the plug for the fishing license. Go out and buy it. Sure. All right, so let's see here. Let's try that. We got to go to the beginning. All right, uh, everybody see that okay? Good to go? Yes. Great. Looking good. All right, well, thank you for the introduction, and I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Um, I, as you said, I'm Nick Kailas. I'm one of the regional fisheries biologists uh, with the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife down here. Um, and today I just wanted to give a quick overview of some of the different fish species that anglers might encounter in the Royal and, and some of the background uh, with them as well. Um, but first, just sort of a high level overview um, from my perspective and our perspective at IFNW. Um, this watershed really presents a wide variety of fishing opportunities. Um, it's very diverse in terms of the species you can catch. You can catch traditionally cold water species, which are things like the trout. You can also catch bass and perch and pickerel, which people generally lump as warm water species. Um, and just that diversity is pretty neat. There's something for everyone to catch. Um, you can fish in a larger river. You can fish in small streams. You can fish in lakes and impoundments and use boats or fish from shore. It's it's a pretty neat system. Um, I, I have a picture here of some people with fly fishing gear, but you know you could be just as successful throwing a worm under a bobber some days. Absolutely no reason that can't work. And you know, sometimes it works better. So in general, it, there's just something for everyone. Um, it, it is in some ways a hidden gem among these larger, more well-known watersheds. Um, everybody knows about the Kennebec and the Androscoggin and the Presumpscot even, but nestled in between them, you know, still close to population centers, still very accessible. 
is the royal. Now, along with your fishing license, I wouldn't be a good fisheries biologist unless I hit on some of the regulations uh, that you know uh, govern the fishing laws on the Royal River. So most of the river is what we call general law, uh, which means that it's open from April 1st to September 30th. Um, with the standard limits for the number of fish and the size, um, things like that. Um, all that is right in the front of your law book when you first open it up. Um, there is a special section though, um, in starting in Yarmouth from the Elm Street Bridge downstream to Tidewater. And that section is actually open year round to fishing, which is uh, pretty unique for streams and rivers in Maine, most close um, from October through March. That section also has a two fish limit on brook trout and that exists to kind of further um, the different opportunities um, throughout the, the fall and early spring season. Um, and that kind of that year round fishery, we like to kind of prolong it by having a little more uh, conservative harvest limits on a popular fish like brook trout. Um, I will also mention that a lot of the stocking um, in this river happens in this special section. So it's often a good place to go. If you check the stocking report, which is updated frequently, you can see right uh, when and where our hatchery trucks have been. And, you know, some people, I swear, follow them right to the river and catch the fish as soon as they're dumped in. Um, if any of this is at all confusing with the special laws and the general law, one thing that I'll recommend you check out is the Fishing Laws online angling tool, conveniently known as Float. And you can find it on our website. It's essentially a big map. Um, and all the waters with special laws, like this section of the Royal, are going to show up in red. And you can click on them, and all the laws will pop up. It makes it very easy. And lastly, I'll just say, you know, there are also other laws and things that you want to check out when fishing different tributaries and lakes in the watershed. So in general, it's always a good idea to consult the law book. But all right, now that I've gotten that out of the way, uh, we'll kind of dig into some of the different species that you can find here. Um, I think in the state of Maine, when you're talking about stream fishing or really fishing in general, you kind of have to start and end with brook trout. It's the most popular sport fish in the state. Um, and it's the last stronghold of really important native populations, really in the entire United States. If you look at the original range of brook trout, Maine is largely intact and most other states are not. So that's something that we really have going for us here. Um, this picture is obviously a brook trout. And um, throughout this, I just figured I'd throw in a few identification tips for each of the fish that you might see. For a brook trout, you look for some a square or very mostly square tail. Some people even call them square tails because of that. Um, it's, it's generally a darker fish with light spots. And that's kind of the opposite of some other trout species that I'll talk about in a second here. And it also has these worm-like markings on the back of it, which are called vermiculations. And I think they're really neat and incredible to look at up close. So hopefully you can get out and see one for yourself here shortly. Um, brook trout are found throughout the entire Royal River drainage. They're probably the most prevalent sport fish along with the most popular one in the system. Uh, we stock it with, I think this is last year's number. So it was 1400 brook trout were stocked last year. Uh, most of them were stocked in the springtime. These were spring yearlings, meaning they were about a year old, uh, generally in the eight to 10 inch range. And then later we'll supplement um, with some fall yearlings, which have had an additional six or so months to grow. They're more in the 11 to 13, 14 inch range. And they help sustain that year round fishery, especially in that lower section of the Royal. There's also many wild populations. We know of at least 15 tributaries, many in, in the upper part of the drainage that support wild brook trout. And I'm sure that's not an exhaustive list. And then I won't go into too much detail, but it's also interesting to note that some brook trout will stray into tidal waters um, off the coast. And that's kind of a unique aspect of a coastal river system like this as well. So second to brook trout, um, in terms of popularity and probably economic importance in, in the royal system, from an inland fisheries perspective, would be the brown trout. Um, they're not native, like brook trout are, but they've been stocked for a long time in the system um, and provide a, a different sort of fishery than the brook trout tend to. Um, historically, browns have been able to grow up to larger sizes and survive for multiple years. 
Um, we'd actually love to get back out there in the next few years and do another study on that, confirm that that's still the case, but we know historically it certainly was. Um, brook trout don't tend to survive quite as long and grow to as large sizes, so brown trout provide that sort of different opportunity. They will also move into tidal waters, and we have some historical reports of you know, fish well over 30 inches in length, which if you're talking about a brown trout in Maine of that size, it's, that's a big fish for sure. I also threw in last year's stocking numbers, um, pretty similar to brook trout, a lot of spring yearlings, and then a few fall yearlings thrown in later to sustain the year-round fishery in the lower section of the river. Um, brown trout are also pretty pre prevalent in Sabbath Day Lake, which is the headwater pond of the Royal River system. Um, they, they grow very well there, and I think I'll touch on that a little bit down the road. And, and just real quick, identification as well is a useful thing for brown trout. Some people, you know, a trout looks like a trout until you get your hands on it a few times, but they have that opposite pattern where they have lighter background and darker spots, which a brook trout again is back the other way around. Um, you may also note if you look in the laws that if you catch a brown trout in a stream, there's a 25 inch maximum limit. It'd be pretty rare to catch a fish of that size, but the reason that that's in there is that sometimes Atlantic salmon, sea run Atlantic salmon can be confused with brown trout. And we really just want to minimize any chance of accidental harvest of that endangered fish. So that's why that maximum limit is on them for brown trout. There is actually a third species of trout you can catch in the royal drainage as well. Um, it's another non-native fish, but also very popular. They're a little bit more limited in their distribution, unlike rookies and brown trout, which are pretty much throughout most of the system. Uh, rainbow trout are stocked only in Chandler Mill or Lily Pond in the upper part of the drainage. Um, they're stocked there because they provide an opportunity for trout fishing um, that you might not otherwise get if it was just brook trout. They, it's sort of a marginal water quality. Brook trout don't survive very well there, but rainbow trout are a little, little more tolerant, and so they do. So we stock them there, and it's a popular little, little fishery. Um, again, if, if you want to ID a rainbow trout, apart from the other two we've talked about, you'll look for a lighter background with dark spots. Only in this case, they have many smaller spots compared to, say, a brown trout, which tends to have larger and sometimes more colorful spots. There's also often a characteristic kind of colorful band along the midline of a rainbow trout, which gives it its name um, and can be a pretty you know, distinctive sight as well. So moving on from trout, um, another very popular sport fish that you can find in the royal system is largemouth bass. They're also not native, but they've been in Maine, especially southern Maine, for a very long time and are really very widespread. Um, actually, in a survey that we did a few years back, largemouth bass and their close cousins, smallmouth bass, are essentially the second most popular sport fish in the state, just behind brook trout. And that popularity is increasing all the time. They're pretty fun to catch and relatively easy to catch as well. Um, if you're looking for them in the Royal, some of the best spots to go are impoundments and lakes, again, kind of towards the upper part of the drainage. Um, things like Runaround Pond, Chandler Mill Pond, and Sabbath Day all support largemouth bass, and some of them can grow to pretty nice sizes as well. They do look pretty different than trout, but just a couple other little ID tips. Um, they have this Generally, they have a dark horizontal stripe, um, darker than the rest of the sort of green-brown background. And the edge of their jaw will extend backwards beyond the rear edge of their eye, which is something that a lot of people use to tell them apart from smallmouth bass, which have sort of that smaller jawline. So I wanted to touch on another interesting species in the system, um, rainbow smelt. Um, sometimes people don't think of these as a sport fish, um, they're often a forage fish for some of our trout species. The trout will eat them and grow really well on the smelt. But smelt can be popular in their own right um, as an actual desired catch. Um, you can catch them often through the ice by hook and line. Um, and in certain places where, it's, where these fisheries are open in the spring, you can catch them with dip nets when they go on their spawning runs. In this system, Sabbath Day Lake would be the place to go. Um, tributaries are closed. To fishing for smelt, but the outlet is open. And there's a strong smelt population in Sabbath Day. Um, 
I mentioned brown trout earlier and how they grow pretty well there. Well, that's because of the smelt. Um, they have a lot to eat. And, you know, we, we really do see Sabbath Day as one of our highest quality and most consistent brown trout fisheries in the region. And then again, if you want to ID a smelt, look for a very small fish. Um, they do get bigger up north, but in this watershed, they tend to be six inches or less on average. They have a very long kind of narrow body, pointed mouth, and a lot of little teeth. So they are kind of a distinctive fish as well once you, once you get your hands on a few. Um, and I just wanted to touch on a couple other things real quick. Um, most of the species covered so far are the most popular species that inland anglers are going to be targeting. But sometimes you catch things that you're not expecting. And this, these are probably some of the two that you'd be most likely to see. Um, they're not typically targeted, but I honestly think they're kind of a fun surprise. And I'm never disappointed when I catch one. It's always kind of a you know, way to add variety to the day's catch. Um, so the two that I've singled out here are the fall fish, which is in the bottom right, and the white sucker, which is in the bottom left. Um, the fall fish is the biggest minnow we have in the state, which is kind of interesting. And suckers are common in most places as well. Um, they're just aggressive enough to bite a lure or a fly, or something you might dangle in front of them. Um, there are plenty of other small fish that live in the system, but you know these are a couple that you're most likely to see. And you know, while I'd love to run through everything you can find out there, uh, in the interest of time, just wanted to focus on these, these sport fish and the more popular uh, fisheries that we have. And then I'll just wrap it up by saying um, that striped bass are another important sport fish in the Royal River system. The reason I threw them at the end, despite their popularity and importance, is that we at Inland Fish and Wildlife don't manage them. It's our sister agency that handles all the saltwater fish and that's the Department of Marine Resources. But it is, it is important to note that they're a very popular catch in tidal waters. I like fishing for them myself. Um, and right about now, they should be kind of showing up again. So something else to look for in the system. But I think in general, that's uh, most of the species that I wanted to highlight. Um, uh, this is a, another plug for the quality of brown trout you can catch in Sabbath Day Lake. Uh, this was one of our hatchery staff, I think a couple of years ago, caught this one. Um, and I've seen many caught just around that size there. So it's a good fishery if you can figure it out. And uh, yeah, I guess at this point, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to take them. Yeah, I'm showing uh, no uh, questions in the chat box. Um, uh, there is a remark from Graham, which is uh, he's caught many uh, fall fish in the Royal River. They're all over the place. And uh, they are. Yeah. I've caught some myself. These are these are what people generally refer to as, as chubs. And uh, they're, 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 they're a lot of places you don't expect them. But uh, once again, yeah. it's it's fishing. That's right. <laughs> Thank any you, other, Nick. Any other questions? Okay, thanks, Nick. Um, yeah. I guess if uh, you, you stop sharing, I will uh, pick up. Okay. Um, anyway, I just uh, before I get uh, into the to to the guide, which is uh, really the uh, the main uh, reason that we're uh, having our teleconference tonight. Um, yeah, I, I would like to think to thank all the people who uh, uh, contributed. Uh, Christine, I, who is our uh, host tonight, and Carl, um, Dave, Craig, who was in charge of the PR and turned out uh, uh, gave us a good turnout tonight. Uh, Debbie Landry, who's our uh, Zoom host and gave me some good hints on how to use uh, Zoom effectively for to present. Uh, Adam Stearns and, uh, Adam, I'm sorry, Alan Stearns and Adam Ferreria of uh, the Royal River, River Conservation Trust, who helped in a, 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 a number of ways. Matt Streeter, who was on our committee and uh, did, did a number of things and is our backup should my uh, computer fail tonight. 
Um, especially like to thank uh, Rob Codio and Don, Don Hodgden. Those are uh, Sebago TU members and RRA members who really uh, contributed the vast majority of the content that I'm going to be showing. Um, it's, you know, it, it, you got to kind of cross a mental hurdle to want to share. And uh, they thought it was worth sharing uh, to keep interest and build interest in the Royal River and restoring it. And uh, last of all, uh, our other presenters, uh, uh, Blandis and Nick. So uh, anyway, I hope that's everyone. Um, what I would also like to say before I start is that, you know, the, the guide is, is, is doing, I think, some significant things, uh, but it, it can't do everything. We're going to be showing you uh, locations where public access is permitted or landowner permission um, to include the, the, the location in the guide was obtained. Um, it doesn't include a number of known locations on the Upper River, Chandler Brook, or East Chandler Brook, uh, where there are scour pools that hold trout. Uh, even as far north as Auburn, you can identify these, uh, usually uh, downstream of a bridge. Uh, the soils and uh, increased water velocities will create a, a large pool. Uh, really, uh, uh, not many of these are posted. Uh, a lot of them are stocked, but uh, landowners did not want to draw additional attention to the location, so we uh, didn't include them. Uh, I guess uh, we haven't noted specific uh, stocking locations for a number of reasons, although we could have. Uh, we, we really encourage people to get out and explore, but have given you a, a certainly plenty of locations to start from. Um, we're calling this the, 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 uh, the frenzy because really the next month is when it's happening. Uh, the fish are, are getting active, the bugs are hatching. Uh, if you're going to fish, do it in the next four weeks. Uh, this dry weather is going to really uh, slow things down earlier than usual this week. So uh, really, we, uh, we hope you can get out there uh, on, on the river. So uh, anyway, uh, what you're going to do to get to the fishing guide is just go to the Royal River uh, uh, website. This is their splice screen. Uh, I'm sorry, this is, uh, yeah, this is their, their splice screen screen. And if you uh, uh, click fish, fishing guide, then uh, this is what you're going to see. And uh, if you click on that button, it's going to direct you to uh, this Google Earth application that we use to implement the guide. And right now, you can actually, uh, if you wanted to click on any of these locations anywhere in the watershed to show a fish, it would give you the information. But really, you get a lot better uh, uh, use of the uh, tool if you go to present. And then what you're going to get is navigation features, uh, table of contents. If you're just interested in part of the watershed, let's say Collier Brook, you could go and just look at those locations. But uh, it gives you the opportunity to go ahead and uh, page through the uh, different locations and uh, information screens that we've provided. Uh, just would like to note too that all the pictures that you're seeing on this uh, splice screen are uh, were taken in the Royal River watershed. Um, the uh, um, uh, next screen we have is, is information is important, access to it. That's the greatest part of thing about the internet. So we've given you a lot of different uh, uh, links to websites that are helpful. Um, uh, freshwater fishing laws uh, that Nick was talking about. Uh, current stocking report. Uh, you know, you get out there too early, it's probably, you know, generally I think a lot of people like to wait until uh, the, 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 uh, the, the fish have been stocked in the spring before they go out. And this will tell you with the, the, the IFNW does an amazing job of keeping this up uh, to date. Uh, within a couple of days after stocking is done, they'll tell you uh, what river, what species, and how many fish were put out. Uh, saltwater fishing laws, if you're going to fish uh, uh, there below Route 88. Tide tables, if you're fishing below 88. Um, the river flows, it's really great. The USGS does have a website that'll tell you if it's high water, low water, whatever. And it also shows you average flows. So you can kind of know, pardon me, know what to expect. Uh, we're not gonna try to uh, teach you uh, how to fish, but uh, we do recommend some uh, fishing methods. There's the water trail 
and uh, some links to Sabeo uh, chapter of Trout Unlimited and also to the Royal River Alliance uh, site again. But uh, anyway, those are there for you to use. And we will direct you to them in certain parts of the, uh, uh, of, of the uh, tour. But um, anyway, as far as fishing methods go, uh, we're not gonna try to teach you how to fish. Um, Beans Adventure Schools, if you really need uh, you know, some very basics, are uh, your friends uh, and, uh, so, and neighbors is definitely the best way to learn how to fish. Uh, we did talk about both saltwater and uh, freshwater uh, um, uh, opportunities. Uh, we, we really have kind of gone uh, you know, heavy toward uh, uh, fly fishing and uh, artificial lures because they tend to be uh, easier on the fish and do let you uh, release the fish that you don't uh, Want to, want to kill uh, more, uh, more uh, um, um, uh, uh, gently. So uh, uh, we, we uh, do recommend uh, for spin fishing, small spinners and spoons. If you are gonna have kids out there, especially if you wanna replace these uh, treble hooks with uh, single hooks, so just a little bigger than the, uh, uh, what you have uh, three uh, tied together on to make a treble hook uh, and then pinch the barb down it's a lot safer proposition. And I'll guarantee you having had uh, treble hooks in both my thumb, my scalp and my ear, uh, it's definitely uh, a lot, uh, lot, lot better if you have, have a single uh, hook with the hard pinch down on it. Nick just talked about the different uh, species. If you got your uh, mobile phone with you, if you forget what he told you, you've got uh, the uh, fish right there. Oh, yeah. um, what we've got um, the, uh, here is, is what we've done is we've taken the, the, um, the uh, uh, watershed and we've kind of split it up into three different sections and um, they're just, just you know, to organize the information. And uh, I think really to most of us, the most important section is going to be here, the lower river. And that really goes uh, uh, mostly uh, within Yarmouth. And uh, this is just a screen just to give you, a, a, you know, kind of a look at what's, what's uh, contained in this section. I uh, just wanted to point out, Landis talked about the, the uh, existing alewife runs. The worst thing that you can do uh, to a river is to cut it off uh, from the uh, ocean. And that's what we're doing here with the Bridge Street Dam and with the uh, East Elm, Elm Street Dam. And, uh, uh, if we did restore uh, alewife runs, it really would benefit the eco ecology of the entire system. Fish coming from the ocean bring nutrients with them. Uh, it doesn't, they don't compete with the native species. They actually and, uh, are gonna uh, enhance them. So uh, anyway, it's, that's, that's really uh, a big part of what the uh, Royal River is all about. And uh, really it is, uh, you know, something that recreational fisher, fishermen like myself uh, really want to see, see that happen because it's going to improve our fishing. What the guide does is it will now take you to, we're going to go through the uh, individual sites. I uh, just kind of like to point out to you is that you still maintain the basic functions of Google Earth if you're used to using that program at all. So you can do things like move the screen, you can zoom out, you can zoom in. And uh, you'll note you do have street names here. So if you're trying to get from point A, point B, it will uh, uh, help you to do that. Uh, if you want to see just really, you know, what we're talking about, you can you can focus, you know, zoom in. So that's that's you really have a lot of good capability here. Um, the uh, first site is what we're calling Grist Mill Park Pool, and this is just below the Route 88 bridge from the. Uh, uh, eat Northeast Bank. Um, what you'll find is most places in the guide, we're going to give you a series of uh, images and uh, they're going to show you, you know, where, where you access, uh, how you get down to the water here at Grismel Park. There's actually a rope, little rope tied there. Uh, we give you links to the tide tables. You probably want to be there around uh, high tide because it gets kind of uh, shallow there at low tide. Outgoing is better. Um, here is the run of water you're, you're really going to be wanting to be fishing if you're a 
trying to catch that elusive uh, sea run trout, either a, a native brookie or a, a brown. Uh, this is probably the best place in the watershed to do it. Just uh, what the uh, owner does say that you can fish there, that does say fish at your own risk, but uh, as we're going to say for all pro uh, uh, areas that are private property, uh, please, you know, pick up after yourself. And if somebody's left something down there, please pick up after them. Uh, it's in everybody's best interest that uh, we do that. So um, anyway, from there, we'll go to the next uh, site. This one is the Lower uh, Falls Pool. And really, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. There's some access from the Grist Mill Park there for uh, spin fishermen. Uh, if you come in from the next site, uh, fly fishermen are going to like uh, the, the uh, head of, uh, of the pool here, which is good fishable water there. But uh, we're going to go to the next site, which is the Sparhawk Mill Pool. And that's accessible uh, from the uh, rear of the Mirror Mill uh, parking lot. Um, you go to the back. There's a, uh, some crude steps leading down to the water. And then there's this run of uh, water there. Something else you can do is if you're on a mobile device, you can actually click uh, you know, on the uh, image and uh, get it to, to, uh, to a display in a larger uh, format. Uh, it's kind of interesting. This, this is probably more water than I'd want to fish down here, but there actually was a, a young, late, young woman uh, down there fishing the morning. We took the pictures. And this uh, is toward the tail of that pool and the head of the next pool. But uh, you do have the ability to, uh, to uh, look, you know, look, look to blow up all of the images there and to, uh, uh, you know, if, if you can't see them on a mobile device, this will give you some help. But uh, this is probably one of the most fish, uh, fished uh, pools in, in the watershed. Moving up a little further, we do have the next pool, which we're calling the Bridge Street Pool. Both below above and the below the bridge is, is fishable. Um, the, the pool is deep in here, and a lot of spin fishermen like to fish this. Um, a lot of the good stocking that uh, Nick was talking about is in the fall, and th this will even stack fish. In the fall, sometimes you can look from the bridge and look down and actually see brook trout just here. Uh, sometimes it's hard to catch them when the water's clear and low, but uh, you, they're there, so uh, it's, it, it's a challenge. Just uh, moving uh, upstream, um, this is really an information point, and uh, if the dam, uh, if the uh, Bridge Street Dam goes, does go out, one of the things that will happen is uh, we're going to have a new riffle. And uh, when you have a riffle, that's a good thing because it oxygenates the water. Um, it will also create a tail of this pool and a head of another pool, which will be good for uh, fly fishing. So uh, uh, what when, when we uh, take dams out, we expose natural features that uh, do help the fishery. The reservoir pool, I'm gonna kind of skip over. There's places along the path that you can uh, uh, spin cast from. The next uh, pool that we will look at is the uh, Middle Falls, what we're calling the Middle Falls Riffle. And this is a nice run of water for either a spin fisherman or a, a trout fisherman, a little bit of a steps leading down to the water there. And uh, that's uh, Mi Middle Falls and there's the bypass that uh, goes around the island there. Another uh, popular spot and another very good spot is what we're calling the East Elm uh, Trail Race. Tail Race, you're gonna have to uh, uh, go kind of up and then back down to get out to this area. Uh, the industrial canal is what's running this way, uh, but uh, right uh, fishing from the point here, nice run of water to fly fish, nice run of uh, water to uh, a spin cast. You can also uh, spin cast from this bank, but it's uh, just not a good uh, situation with back cast for uh, fly fishermen there. The next spot is if you keep going or else if you drive around and park any of these places is the, what we're calling the East Elm Street Pool. You take Elm Street and then uh, Melissa to Park Street 
there's a bench here and even a, a part a bike parking area. It's kind of steep here, but this is another pool that if you're a uh, spin fisherman, you probably would want to wet a line. And and uh, just something I, I meant to say, and I want to make sure that I do do say is uh, any of these places, especially if you're on a weekend, there may be you know already a fisherman or two there. If, if the spot's occupied, don't you know don't crowd somebody out. Try a different spot. Uh, that's, uh, you know, if you're not catching or if you just don't like what, you know, the way the water is running at any of these location, we encourage you to move around. That's really uh, a good way to, to uh, increase your odds of being, of being successful. So, uh, you know, one of the things that, that the uh, guide does give you is options. So we uh, certainly uh, recommend that you, uh, you exercise the, the, those options. The last place in what we're calling the lower river to fish is the reservoir and mostly just uh, spin casting from here. Um, you know, we can we could bring up the, uh, uh, the these the, the uh, is pretty easy to, to figure this out. So I'm not going to go into much detail, but this is also what we're, the uh, the takeout for the East Elm Street uh, location. Uh, we're going to recommend two float trips, fish and float kind of uh, of uh, trips. And this would be the takeout point for uh, the lower of those two trips. And uh, what we'll show you next is going to be the uh, the uh, put-in uh, spot. So we'll jump on up to there, and that's the West Custago Park. Um, it's got a, a, a parking area. It's not, uh, you know, not overly developed, but there certainly is a clear path down to the water and a good place to launch a canoe. Uh, if you, you know, this is probably, a, you know, would be a short paddle if you weren't fishing, uh, but if you're going to stop and fish, um, I would think mostly for bass in this lower section, then uh, this this would be, uh, uh, you know, a, a good, uh, you know, good length up to uh, for a canoe and fish kind of an outing. Uh, probably a short, too short a trip if, if, if you were just going to paddle it. Okay, but next uh, we'll go to the, to the uh, some of the sites in the upper river. Um, this one, we weren't able to get landowner permission on uh, either, either side, but where Collier Brook comes into uh, to the Royal, we do have uh, uh, a confluence. And what happens is the Royal runs colder than any other part of the watershed. Spring fed, that's where the hatcheries are because the water is so, so good. And uh, when the main stem is warming up, this water is still running cold. And when it starts to get warmer than the fish like, it attracts fish. So sometime mid-June, you know, third week in June, maybe even earlier this year, there's going to be a time when this will actually attract fish. Um, if you're going to be canoeing down, then uh, you know to uh, the West Coast to go uh, put in takeout. Then uh, this is definitely a place you want to stop. Uh, Pineland Farms. Uh, this it's legal for anybody to fish there, but boy, this this certainly seems like a great place to take kids. And you you hate to you hate to see uh, adults taking a limit here. It's really a, you know pretty little pond. It is stocked. And uh, certainly, if you got if you got a niece or a granddaughter or some or, or a child that you want to take, uh, this is this is certainly a, you know the place to try on the worms and uh, try to catch a trout. Especially early in the year, it's going to warm quick. Uh, it is generally stocked early, and uh, you know it, I would go uh, last week or this week, and it's going to get harder after that. Penny Road. Um, this is your put-in that uh, for the uh, for the upper uh, canoe fishing trip that we uh, talked about. Uh, it's also a nice um, a nice pool here, and um, the, uh, the the pool itself is is really uh, a nice run of water below the bridge, kind of around this corner. Uh, good for fly fishing. Good for uh, spin fishing as well. Stevens Pond, another spot for the kids here. They've got special uh, limitations so that only kids are supposed to fish. 
uh, once again, I'd want to go, uh, you know, soon this, you know, this month, early into next month, this, this is going to warm up and it's not going to be uh, conducive to catching any trout, but uh, within the next month, uh, once again, a great place to take the kids uh, here. Do, there are special regulations and uh, kids are only, uh, are, are, you know, adults are not, uh, not uh, permitted to fish here. Okay, uh, Bald Hill Road Falls. This, uh, I'm really glad we were able to uh, include this uh, in the guide. Uh, this is really the most scenic uh, place in, in the watershed as far as I'm concerned. Um, you uh, park uh, past the bridge, there's a, a pull off, and it's just gorgeous. I've caught trout, you know, in this pool that have come up from the main, the main stem of the Royal River. And it, it just, it's really, I think, the prettiest spot in the entire watershed. And that's where it finally tails off into flatter water, but uh, re really an amazing spot. Mostly uh, better suited, I think, to fly fishing than, than anything else. Uh, Lily Pond. Um, Definitely some good opportunities there. Uh, rainbow trout, uh, bass, uh, have a really nice canoe launch there now, thanks to the Chandler family. Uh, it's located right about there. And uh, uh, the, I'll let you, we're, we're kind of running, starting to run a little close on time. So I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail with this. That's, that's why we've got the, gu the guide so that you can, you can uh, look at the detail yourself. Sabbath Day Lake, uh, you can fish down from the outlet. Uh, this is, you know, unless you, you, you're prepared to, to uh, do small water fishing and do some hiking to find where the fish are, uh, I wouldn't suggest this. This is probably not, this is not for a novice. This is somebody who's used to fishing small water. Uh, Sebago TU is gonna be uh, looking to schedule a presentation on how to fish skinny, what we call skinny water or small water. It's a little different than uh, what you typically think of as uh, trout fishing and fly casting, but uh, uh, it's definitely uh, can be a, a, an amazing experience. And just being on a small stream is 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 off, so often a joy, especially this time of year. Uh, Sabbath Day Lake, uh, the uh, the launch is right here. It is uh, a, a pay launch, and the parking is limited, but. Uh, Nick's told you about the fishing there for brown trout and smelt, and I uh, think that's pretty makes it pretty special. Okay, I definitely uh, didn't want to have to cut short uh, Collier Brook. Uh, this is the best water in the watershed. It's the the uh, coldest. It's the mo the best. Uh, it's the best aerated because this is gravel over here. It's not that Presumpscot uh, fo uh, formation of of clay. Uh, like so much of the watershed is, this is by far the best water. This is probably where the Atlantic salmon spawned uh, when they uh, uh, were present in the watershed, in fact, abundant in the watershed until the uh, 1840s when the, the dams uh, put an end to the run. Um, the, uh, there is a uh, dam that uh, is non-functional that's on Pineland Farm uh, property. It used to be the water source for the old uh, state school there. Um, the, uh, it's, it's a good, good place to fish below the dam. Uh, the access is the hard part and we've given you a map on how to walk in there. You park up on Depot Road. You, you don't want to uh, lock this mailbox, but then this gives you the way to get down to the, uh, the pool. Then you go by the pavilion. There's a little path by the pavilion to fish this. And this water's higher than you, know, than you would normally be fishing it, but uh, definitely this area in here all holds fish. The upstream area is uh, for really for spin fishing and I'm not gonna dwell on uh, that one. Uh, the Merrill Road Pool. Um, 
good pool. This is, uh, well, once again, the, the fishing here will stay good into July and August. Good uh, scour pool here below the bridge, especially is good fishing. The uh, footbridge pool, and uh, once again, it's, uh, it's you know, you're, you're gonna park up in here and then have to walk down here. And we do have some directions, which I don't think, I don't think you're gonna get lost if you, if you uh, use the guide to get in here. But uh, anyway, it does show you uh, this, this section here is this long dead water. But eventually you'll see this uh, footbridge And a uh, nice pool below that, there's a uh, cascade. What's really amazing for fly fishermen is below that, the water's a little high here, but the water goes into small pools, what we call pocket water. And this is probably the, one of the prettiest sections of, of, uh, of water, uh, of uh, brook that you're gonna find anywhere in Southwestern Maine. Really a really, you know, a nice place to, uh, uh, to put a fly in and just skitter it across the, the top of the water and sometimes get a, a trout to come up and take it, but just a gorgeous place, really. <clears throat> Old Mill Run, um, access from there is from uh, Route 100, Route 400, just uh, there's a path that goes around this, and this is small water fishing. You're going to be looking for brush piles and deep holes and uh, try to fish those or, or rock. There are actually some rock uh, places too that do hold fish. Another uh, pool is off Morris Road, Brandy Brook. The entire length of that is, is really uh, pretty, pretty fish. It's very small water fishing, and it's kind of a rugged hike in there, but definitely uh, some good water there as well. The last thing I'm going to tell you about in Collier Brook is the new Gloucester fish hatchery. This is where all the brown trout in that are uh, raised in the state are hatched out initially. Um, this we're going to organize a tour probably in uh, July or August if you've never seen a fish hatchery uh, or fed fish in a hatchery or any of these things we think you'd find this uh, very enjoyable. Uh, the last things are uh, our Random Mill Dam. Uh, this is an informational site. And uh, Fred Falver's in on the teleconference. Uh, he, he's the one who allowed us to remove this dam from his property about uh, six years ago. And I'd just like to, uh, again, thank him for uh, doing that. Uh, it increased the overall uh, health of the watershed. There's uh, good fishing on our uh, uh, further upstream and there's also a uh, runaround pond. But uh, anyway, that, that, that is my uh, formal presentation. Uh, I don't see any questions in the chat box. Does anybody have any questions? Steve, this is Landis. Am I unmuted? Yes, ma'am. Was it hard for you to share secret favorite places in putting this together? Well, like I said, we 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 kind of had some soul some soul searching uh, uh, moments there uh, within within the work group because uh, you know there's there's a, a you know a certain uh, something that's that's kind of thinking is this is my spot and you, and you don't want to share but what you what you realize is that the important thing is that we want people to really appreciate this little watershed for, for, for being as cool as it is. I, I was really amazed that, that once I, I, I started into this, just how much there is there. And to be honest, there's another 10 sites that we, we really you know, couldn't put, put up because, because of uh, landowner concerns. And uh, it really is you know, quite a watershed. And the best thing we can do to improve it is to get the dams out. And, uh, you know, I really hope that message comes through uh, tonight. It's really, uh, that is, is really what we hope will be the uh, end result and really what would be the best thing we can do to make 
a nice watershed even better. Steve, this is, this is Christine. I have a question. Uh, can we hire you out as a guide if we want to go fishing? Uh, that's that's not, not legal to do. I'd have to be licensed, but um, okay. You know, but, but anyway, uh, I, my, um, I was going to say my, uh, my email address is here if anybody does have questions and um, on the last slide. And also if, if someone is into this and does find anything which isn't quite right or, or whatever, um, then uh, please, please, uh, please get in touch with me and we'll fix it. But uh, let's see, I see a Let's see, I see a question, yeah. question box. Let's see, a question for Nick from Carl. Uh, let's see, the land, it says, my last, to my knowledge, the last habitat assessment of the Royal was done in 1958 in IF&W. Is the department planning to do another one soon? Um, are you still on, Nick? Yep, I'm still here. It should Thank be un, unmuted. Um, yeah, uh, 1958 was a touch before my time, so I, I can't really comment too much on what that assessment accomplished, but um, I will say, I mentioned earlier, you know, the, the history of holdover brown trout in the river does have us very interested, and I think a component of any assessment of holdover brown trout would be habitat. So I don't know if we have a formal habitat assessment scheduled right now, but it, it you know, it's definitely something that we would do as part of you know, an assessment of brown trout and that sort of thing. And hopefully we can get to that in the near future. Okay, uh, thank uh, you. Chris, Any other questions? I, I'd like to make a comment. This is Bill Gregory. Um, first of all, great gratitude to you and your team, uh, Steve. It's a wonderful job. Um, and that this whole uh, environmental system that we're looking at here, as is true throughout the earth, uh, is interdependent. And so you, this is fish oriented. Make a healthy place for the fish. You've made a healthy place for the birds, for the plants, for the other creatures that live there, including human beings. Um, so when we talk about taking down the dams, we're not only talking about Trout Unlimited being uh, applauding, but we're talking about the health of the whole system, uh, including uh, the, the the whole environment. So I just want to keep that perspective in mind as we proceed with this good work. It, it's a great comment, Bill. Yes. It, it re truly, I mean, it's 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 it all works together. And if we, you know, it, improving one part is going to improve the other. And uh, certainly, uh, we 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 the, the biggest thing I think we're all working for is to get the lower dams out. And if we can do that, it's the bit the best thing we can do for not only the fish, but for everything else that depends on, on them in the watershed. Absolutely. Thank you, Steve, so much. Uh, a wonderful guide that you've put together. And we really appreciate all the work that went into it by everyone involved. And thanks especially to, to Nick and to Landis for presenting tonight as well. Really interesting information. Well, yeah. the, the last part of this then is, um, we didn't, you know, we, this this is not meant to be a one-time deal. Uh, we've got this up, and it's up on the website, and it can be accessed freely by anyone at any time. Uh, what we're going to do is Debbie's been nice enough to uh, stay with us and keep the uh, the uh, uh, teleconference up for about the next. Well, we'll keep it up until eight thirty. And uh, if you're, you know, if you want to go on your computer and uh, just try to use the guide. If you have any questions, I'm gonna stay on the teleconference. Please just come back into the teleconference and ask your questions and we'll just see how this works for you. So anyway, I'd just like to, to thank, thank everybody for turning out. Uh, it, it was a, truly a pleasure to be able to present the information and to share it with you about the, the wonderful Royal River watershed we all uh, enjoy. Thank you.